everybody. Um, I'm Karen. I'm one of the fellows here at Data and Society. Uh, and welcome to our Data Byte. Uh, we're excited today to have Phil Howard joining us. Um, he's at the Department of Communication at University of Washington, um, but is joining us more directly today from Budapest. Uh, so we're very happy to have him here. Um, I'll let Phil introduce himself, and then um, we'll pause and let you know kind of who's in the room. But I've, I've never done this. <laughs> well, and I'm uh, happy with that intro. My name is Phil Howard. Uh, I teach, teach at the University of Washington, but have been physically in Budapest for the last two years, starting a, a new public policy school uh, as part of the um, uh, Open Society CEU Soros conspiracy to um, uh, encourage open institutions around the world. Thank you. Um, well, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, this is a... Um, an important moment for me for several reasons. The first of all, I have been in Budapest for two years, and so I have not had any coriander. And just walking into the room smelling coriander has been the highlight of my day so far. Um, I'm looking forward to your questions and your feedback. I brought us several stacks of books that are yours, um, if you're still interested in this topic after, after hearing me talk. Um, the book uh, dropped last week, and so uh, I've been spending uh, the last few days trying to talk it up and promote it and share some of the ideas and, and get a sense of what's, uh, what's going to be next for me. And one of the things that I think is important about your community, or well, that I'm looking forward to getting, getting feedback on, is where to go with this question of what the Internet of Things might mean for our political lives. So for my 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so, I'll, I'll introduce the book and go quickly through um, some of the examples. I expect many of you have heard different, different uh, um, stories for these examples, um, most of the crowd that I presented to is still curious about what the Internet of Things is. We may be curious, uh, but probably for different reasons. Most of the public, I think, is not aware of um, what the proliferation of wireless devices, um, the, Im the embedding of these devices in everyday things will mean for, for political life. Um, but after I talk about the book, I'd like to talk about the project that I'm going to work on next and um, would be very grateful for, grateful for some feedback on essentially how to help y the European Union spend its money on the study of the political implications of the Internet of Things. Uh, so let me start off with this um, the storyline for the book. <coughs> um, this project began when some of uh, the folks I uh, work with found a botnet that uh, Syria's pre President Bashir had commissioned to help choke off the Syria hashtag about two years ago. There was a moment of a month or so where most journalists, most of the Western public, was trying to find out what was going on in Syria over the Syria hashtag. and. Um, uh, Al-Assad commissioned a firm in Bahrain to flood the Twitter hashtag for Syria with uh, soccer scores and soap opera stories and tourism pictures. And I think that was one of the first moments in, in international politics anyway, where we saw that you could actually pay to choke off a political conversation at a time of crisis uh, when people were excited about using social media uh, as a way of getting stories from the ground, um, but found that this way of getting content out of uh, Syria was not reliable, um, not consistent, um, and easily choked off. This, um, I have five examples of what the Internet of Things um, can be, is already. Uh, this is the, uh, the model, the famous LG TV that was caught sending the file names, the metadata for anything you plugged into the USB ports off to Samsung. Um, that was an English, uh, uh, English software engineer who caught this happening. He queried Samsung, asked if the files were actually being uploaded. Um, Samsung said they weren't being uploaded. It was just the, just the metadata. Um, and they issued supposedly a firmware updated that, uh, update that prevented this, this upload of um, metadata. Then another group, um, within a, a month, tried to see if they could remotely activate the camera on the uh, smart televisions and found that they could, and so did this um, fun blog research, right? Much of, this, uh, much of what we know about bots proceeds through fun blog research. They issued a 
uh, uh, um, they issued a report online arguing that if you have a smart television, you should turn it away from the bed if you keep the, t if you keep the TV in your bedroom. There are uh, cows on the Internet of Things. There's some two and a half thousand cows that have embedded chips uh, in them uh, in one of their stomachs. Two and a half thousand cows in Holland, another two and a half thousand in, in Montana. Um, and this is an experimental system designed simply to teach the farmer about how the digestive tracts are going. But I think one of the interesting things people don't realize that the Internet of Things is very much about our bodies, right? It's about immersing us in consumer-grade electronics, right? creating consumer-grade electronics we would want in our homes. Um, but it's also about healthcare. It's also about um, providing ways to measure uh, change in biological systems and generate data that might um, improve, in this case, um, improve agricultural production. Um, this is the app. Um, this is the Lone Plus app that uh, that loan officers use to shut off the ignition of a car that, uh, for which the payments have not been made um, consistently. And um, there was a story in Nevada uh, about a year ago about a, a woman who needed to get her daughter to the hospital quickly. She hadn't kept up on the payments in her car and found that the ignition wasn't working when she, she needed to get to the hospital. There was a, a much more high profile New York Times piece on this, this application. Um, more recently when a family was stuck in New Jersey. They had gone on Sunday to a park, uh, to roam around a park and found when they came back from the park they couldn't drive back to New York. And so this made the New York Times, right, being stuck in New Jersey because the, um, the Internet of Things had allowed a bank to shut off, um, shut off and disable the ignition. So um, the Internet of Things involves household devices embedded with sensors, right? And I think formally uh, you need you need four things, right? It's a, you need a chip with a power supply, a wireless radio, at least one sensor, and an address on the internet. Right, the four things that define an object um, as far as the internet of things is concerned. So these are household devices embedded with sensors. Uh, anything that is human made can come embedded with such a sensor. These sensors, these chips can be in our bodies or cow's body. The data feeds existing institutions, right? So we may be excited, I think, as a community about the ways of imagining disruption in traditional institutions, but for the most part, the Internet of Things is being rolled out in such a way as to provide banks with better data, to provide pharmaceutical firms, to provide insurance companies with better data, right? That's essentially the institutional rollout model for the Internet of Things. Um, I expect many of you have heard about the, um, uh, another English fellow who had a, a wireless pacemaker defibrillator installed uh, in his body and found that he, he also was a software engineer, but found that he did not have a right to the data about his heartbeats. And he worked through his doctor to see if the doctor could get access to the raw data about his heartbeats. The doctor was denied access. The doctor has access to the, the metadata that came through Bosch Medical Systems, but the, the raw data on heartbeats was proprietary. So, the Internet of Things feeds existing institutions. The data that's collected over the Internet of Things can be about you but is not yours. And um, I expect many of you know the Uber Rides of Glory research, right? So, um, the data is very much about your behavior, not your attitudes or your aspirations. Now, I don't know um, Manhattan as well as you do, but this was a simple study uh, where Uber took uh, a look at the rides commissioned between 10 at midnight one night and then the rides commissioned the next morning between 6 and 8 a.m., right, by the same person. Um, and then tracked which neighborhoods people seem to be leaving from and going to. And uh, I assume this is meat meatpacking, or actually maybe this is this neighborhood, right? So, they were able to draw maps, very simple heat maps for um, Seattle, New York, Washington DC, Madison, a bunch of cities around the United States. I um, used to live up here in this dead zone. Um, it looks like Alphabet City and you know, it goes to Brooklyn for fun. So they wanted to tell, again, a fun blog-based research story about where people go overnight. And this got negative attention, right? People were not aware that the data could be used this way to reveal their actual habits. 
Um, and this particular post isn't available on, it's mirrored now in many spots, um, but you, uh, you can't find the research on, on um, uber.com itself anymore. Okay, so the devices are embedded with sensors. Everything that humans, uh, is human-made can have one. These appear in our bodies. They feed existing institutions. The data is about you, but not yours. And it's behavioral, profoundly behavioral data. Um, since I have a live connection, I just want to show this um, map that maybe some of you have seen. Um, it is... Um, To me, this is um, a dull map in the sense that whenever I load it, it basically tells the story of device networks attacking each other, where the attacks launch in China and are responded to in uh, the United States. So these are device networks that are um, being used by hackers, governments, um, many different kinds of agencies to attack one another. Right? This infrastructure is not simply about consumer services, um, but is a means of projecting political power. And this, this live tracker um, will tell us something about the origins and the responses. Once in a while, um, a country other than China or the United States pops up, Russia, Canada occasionally appears, but it's, it's, a, it's a few geopolitical powers that use device networks well to attack and observe each other. Um, I mean denial of service attacks, um, device counts, and um, um, I actually don't know what I, the IP um, Norse King, what else they track, but it's mostly, it's not financial networks. Um, it's the, the open port <coughs> devices that are on the net. Um, and I also, I would guess, this is a good question, Mark, I, I think that our data on what, um, how traffic flows within China is probably not as good as the data that passes over any of the internet exchange points outside of China. Okay, this is a static version of the same, the same map. Okay. As a, um, a fun exercise for the book, I tell the story of three different internets. The one that starts sort of 1995, right, the year the NSF effectively privatized the internet, and I fully appreciate you could tell the story pre-95, but I start 95 and go to the early 2000s, the moment when most of the devices, most of the content being produced over the internet went from coming out of personal computers and um, to coming out of mobile phones. So if the first chapter of the internet, the recent internet, Involves mobile phone, uh, involves mobile, uh, involves laptops. The second chapter involves mobile phones, and I think we've just come through a, a significant transformation where the vast majority of the traffic now is between devices, between devices that communicate about us. Um, but much of the traffic is not so much cultural content anymore, um, and many of the things talking to each other are not people, but devices reporting on their big data. And I'm a big fan of deconstructing in industry propaganda because industry is always bullish, right, about the next internet. And so this, the red line, is simply the, the range of possibilities for the number of devices on the internet. Um, the, they go from sort of 30 billion devices by 2020 to 50 billion devices. Last week there was another projection of 200 billion devices. So not only in the last few years do we have many more things attached to the internet than we have people, but um, within the next five years, there will be hundreds of billions more devices than we have now uh, immersed in our lives and in our bodies. And our uh, conversation about the political impact of this technology change is just starting. So the goal of the book is to, is to try to poke along the conversation. I'm gonna skip ahead um, because I um, end the book with a couple of ideas about what, how we might get an internet of things that we'd actually like. And this is an area I'd, I'd love your feedback on, because for me, these are, these are um, fantasies. If um, one of my assumptions in the book is that uh, we've probably lost the privacy debate. Mm -hmm. and, and if we haven't lost it, the internet of things, I think, will close the question of privacy. And I'm sure we can debate that. 
I think it will be very difficult to imagine a world in which f firms and governments consistently and responsibly respect privacy. The best scenario I think we might be able to create would be an Internet of Things in which government and firm, firms have their back doors, do their data mining, um, you know, produce good consumer-grade electronics for us, but also allow us to choose the civil society groups that would also have access to the big data that flows out of these, uh, these objects, these devices. I think there's four ways to get us there, to allow civic groups to have equal access, to be equal players in the politics of the next five years. The first idea is something um, very simple. I ripped from the Blood Diamonds campaign, right? One of the really innovative things that the Blood, Di Blood Diamond campaigners did was to get um, re and diamond sellers simply to report the ultimate beneficiary, uh, the source of the diamond that was being bought and sold. I think we should be able to expect each device, each chip, each thing we buy and bed in our house or our body to report who the ultimate beneficiary of the data is. Now, this list of ultimate beneficiaries may change. We can assume it'll include the manufacturer, an industry lobbying association, perhaps all also government agencies as needed. But just being able to see the list of organizations that is making use of the data collected from your light bulbs, cars, you know, coffee makers, would be a significant step, I think, for civic, civic conversation. I think it may also be possible to build an Internet of Things that tithes that allows you to dedicate 10% of the processing time, sensory data, 10% of the bandwidth, 10% um, of the devices in your household to some cause. Um, during, the, um, during the Green Revolution, summer 2009 in Iran, uh, one of the interesting things for those of us who study civic engagement was watching Americans who knew nothing about uh, politics in the Middle East set up tour servers, right? contribute processing time to a, a democracy advocates they had never met, would never meet. And um, for me, those stories are what's exciting about the possibility of the Internet of Things, that I could fulfill my house full of devices that I would get to share with movements I care about. So an Internet of Things that ties could keep that infrastructure civic in some way. In addition, I'd love to be able to add groups to the flow of data. So I want to see the list of groups who benefit from the data. I'd love to be able to dedicate some of the computational resources to the groups I want to support. And I, I'd like to be able to add to the list of um, beneficiaries. If uh, Melita is collecting my coffee data, reporting what I consume to the American Coffee Lobbying Association, and I want to support my favorite uh, Haitian coffee collective, with data about my habits, I should be able to send that through um, uh, to support their research. Final idea um, would be an extension of the nonprofit rule. Before tackling this topic, I studied data mining by political consultants. And one of the few rules in the US that governs data mining is the rule that you can't profit off of voter registration files. So a data miner will take data, if you're a, um, a woman who purchases contraceptives on your credit cards, you're not pro-life, and the National Organization for Women wants that data. Right? Uh, the NRA, if you're purchasing guns or bullets on your credit card, you might not do that, but some people do. Uh, the NRA wants that data, and it becomes valuable when you can marry the contraceptive purchase with purchases with the bullets with your voter registration files, but technically a firm, a consulting firm, is not supposed to make money off that one variable. It should be possible to extend the list of variables that you can't profit on. And I don't have a strong sense of what that list of variables, variables would be. I'd imagine it could include things relevant to public health, things that would help investigative journalists, things that would help researchers. Um, but the precedent is there to identify so kinds of information that are public goods, and I think we could add to the list of things that, you know, I'm not about killing markets, but I think creating a pool of variables that we can all talk about, we can all share in, would give us that better Internet of Things. 
So this project is done. I think for the next um, month or two, I'm going to try to do some more public writing to fill these I ideas out. So if they're terrible, please tell me, because um, I won't push them. I'll come up with other ones. Um, and then next year, I have to, I'm going to start a very large project for the European Union to study bots and how political bots are used to manipulate public opinion in other countries. And the, the unwritten part of this story is that um, people, um, policymakers in Europe suspect that um, Russia and China use bots to manipulate political conversations during elections in Europe. So it's a two and a half million dollar, uh, euros. We have five years to go. Um, for those of you looking for postdocs or getting close to finishing your grad, um, grad degree, we'll need you if you're interested in bots. Uh, <laughs> if you're interested in bots, and, and technically Europe, you have to be interested in being in Europe. Um, but we have to organize a suite of conferences. Um, we have to decide how to track. I'm in ethnographically inclined, so um, my interest is in trying to find the bot writers. Um, I live in uh, Hungary at the moment, and uh, Orban has a team of four or five bot writers. Um, he doesn't know who they are, but uh, he commissions bots on particular topics. And uh, I need to find that team in Russia and, and find the bot writers in China and be, ready, be able to talk to them when public opinion in Europe seems to be getting poked and prodded um, by political interests outside the country. Uh, so, I, I'm looking for advice on who might be interested in this, uh, or what else should be on the agenda, how to expose. And it's not social bots, bots broadly, it's, it's political bots that I'm interested in. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm open to questions. Yeah. Thank you. Piers, have you met any of these bot writers before? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Yes, we've worked with um, Drupal bot writers. Um, we've worked with bot writers who um, <coughs> craft ways of tracking changes to Wikipedia, um, especially as they concern hot button issues in Europe um, or China. And those are the easy bot writers to find because <coughs> We know the Chinese are sensitive on Tibet and the Spratly Islands, and you know, we know what the, the we know which Wikipedia pages get uh, aggressively edited. The trickier thing um, is finding the uh, finding the people who work for money that comes in bags, right? And th in Hungary, that's that's uh, that's the network, right? Um, almost all of the political. Almost all of the uh, authoritarian regimes that I've studied have uh, political consultants who learn from political consultants who develop their skills in the U.S. Right. So the major major presidential elections are um, the big money opportunities to develop new data mining techniques. Between presidential elections, the consultants go to Canada, Australia, Scandinavia, that practice their art. And then a year later, they go to other countries in Europe. A year, year later, they go to authoritarian regimes, and then they return to the U.S. This is the sort of employment, a common employment cycle. So the entry path I think I'll have for the next couple of years is to follow them as they go across, the, as they ply their trade across around the world. <laughs> Thank you, Sita. I wish I had an answer for you. Um, so I have a question um, pertaining to I've questions about the bot stuff, but I'll save that for later. But I have a question about the book and where you end up. Um, it sounds like part of what you're trying to argue towards the end of the book is, or you're trying to create the conditions for a market for civic innovation, is how I interpreted it. And I'm just wondering if you can explain why nonprofits, like, how do I phrase this? Like, there's work by Lucy Bernholtz and Rob Reich at Stanford University that talks about accountability with nonprofits. And so I'm wondering, like, do you just accept nonprofits and civil society to be full of good? <laughs> like, what's the normative vision <laughs> that, because it sounds almost as if, you know, like, you take it as a given that these are good people. Um, bad nonprofits. I think it's, um, 
for me, the contrast, so for me, the contrast is not so much, um, for me, the important distinction is between governments that provide public goods and firms that provide private goods, sometimes in large ways uh, to everybody. And, and then the non-governmental sector is the group of other creative people who don't do things for, for, for profit motive, um, but are still incredibly creative when it comes to applying new technologies to solve collective action problems. So um, I agree that there would be um, bad political parties, um, bad doctors, and bad researchers using data. But if we don't find ways of uh, allowing civil society groups to play with data, most of the playing will happen with, within Facebook, right? within Google, and within the government agencies that seek to spend money. Um, you know, the, another way, if I can take your question and ask it another way, is, is um, isn't there, uh, aren't there examples of uh, good things being done with the Internet of Things by firms or governments? And I'd say, especially in the domain of smart cities, there's, there's some great examples of what can be done with um, lots of sensors distributed in urban settings. Um, but if, uh, if there's an infrastructural bias against supplying civic groups with access to data, then those groups will have less access to the most significant, poli most significant political surveillance infrastructure we've ever built. I, I don't think we can withdraw fully um, government involvement or, or, or the data mining of major firms from that surveillance infrastructure. I would say that what we could hope for is to make sure civil society that every country has an EFF and every country has a CDT and, and every major civil society group has an info policy person who watches how government information policy impacts their environmental activism. That, that for me, that's the best, the best possible outcome over the next five years. I had a very similar question. So you said you're not into killing markets but then you went to a question of better. And when I look at the mode of governance that you're proposing, it really sounds like a financial regime. It sounds like an SEC kind of situation because it's report who benefits, take a tax that you're calling a tithe. I kind of missed number three. And then the last one was define, draw a line between what makes money and what doesn't make money. Um, and although your PAX has the word design in it, Actually, you didn't advance any deep design changes or any deep paradigmatic shift in the collection of data. Your regulatory model seems to be something about markets, and then markets doesn't appear in your packs. Um, so I spend most of my time watching um, engineers who attend uh, these IEEE meetings right, and discuss um, platform and interoperability and have their own um, labs paid for by chip designers and have um, deep investment in what standards decisions get made. And for me, um, I think it would be very difficult to, um, as, as we know in science and technology studies, once you roll out a technology, it gets very difficult to change um, the norms of practice once they get um, once they get uh, once they're diffused once they're created in other other countries it gets very difficult to change um, habits. Now, I wouldn't say that I'm. Uh, I can't tell. I'm listening to your your question is great one because it, it makes it's forcing me to think about whether I'm pro or anti market. I'm not as pro market say as a way of solving uh, making the Internet of Things more public. I'm not as pro-market, say, as what um, Lanier would argue is a way of um, micropayments for little bits of our data that create new economies for privacy. I, I don't know that that is a feasible way of injecting privacy or user control back into the Internet of Things. Um, and um, similarly to CETA, I don't see a way of pulling the NSA out of the Internet of Things. I don't see a way of pulling the Chinese security services out of their Internet of Things, right? Alibaba is making enormous investments in an Internet of Things that will be Chinese. So if there's no way to pull the NSA out, right, and if there's no way to pull um, the Chinese security services out of the, the largest information ecology that's 
not the one we inhabit, um, I think we should tr think about ways to create spaces for other civic groups to play. And, um, yeah. But I'd, ha I'd be happy to go talk more Do you wanna if you want to respond and push me further. I guess I think you come, you've posed it as though it's a political problem. And then markets are secondary. And then you've offered a model of governance that is actually totally about money and um, value. And so it's that order that I'm curious about because I would pose it the other way. I would say this is about a situation where markets have become generators of data into which the state is going and the problem is the political one, not the problem of value because the markets already know what they value. So I'm curious about why the solution to a political problem is a set of rules that are familiar already to markets. Uh, so I agree with you in the sense that um, many of the engineers that I talk to seem to be eager for some political guidance. Um, most of the ones I've been spending time with in the last year are in, based in Europe, and European um, European policymakers are you know, the, they're much more interested in developing a European European values for data and European values for innovation. And I think it's it's conceivable that Europe will generate some of these policy ideas for engineers to, to work to or work around um, before any market mechanisms or before anything in the US or China you know, s sets some market ways of injecting the public. So I, I think I agree with you that, that there may be political situations, or there may be political solutions. I don't know if they'll arise in the United States. I don't know which federal agency would, would help find that political solution. Potentially a related question. I, I wonder, so if the privacy debate is, is dead and um, you know, if there's nothing to sort of stop the sort of um, surveillance state or the corporate you know, data mining, then what are the incentives for either of those two to go down the path that you're suggesting in some ways? I mean, is it, I mean, is it a market sort of based, um, like will consumers demand this and then so um, Alibaba will, um, I don't know, maybe share data with the civil society or is it, you know, the government reg regulation or, or something else? Um, then also I wonder uh, I, that the, the civil society actors who will be let in or the nonprofits will be let into this sort of space will probably be the ones that are legitimized by the, the powers that be, not like, you know, maybe some um, marginal um, nonprofits or civil society actors. So I just wonder how, how you might deal with that. Is that when civil society groups, is that there's more space for civic groups here to do creative things with technologies. And um, the, I have a section in the book on um, how technologies, um, how people use technologies to create new governance systems when governments fail. And the notion here is not that people use their mobile phones to govern, but that they, pr they use their mobile phones to provide governance goods, usually specific services designed to solve specific problems around public hygiene or education or safety. And um, I, think in, I think the West, I think governments, um, governments in the West have a good history of responding well to good ideas uh, that come out of obvious examples of their inability to provide governance goods. So um, um, when uh, aid, agen aid agencies, for example, are becoming much more responsive to these um, collective, uh, collective mapping projects in some of the world's great slums, um, there is a um, uh, significant investment now from the Danes in uh, humanitarian drones. Right? So most of the news coverage is about how drones are used for military applications, but um, there's several great groups using drones to, um, in Hungary in particular, using drones to help activists uh, show that they have hundreds of thousands of people turning out for protests, not 10. The government says, oh, you've got 10 people in the street and, and, and the drones can document how many people are actually attending these events. So, you know, there's drones for journalism. There's, there's a lot of creative projects that um, tend to emerge here that might work well in other places. And uh, so 
So I think, I think that, that obvious problem solving and the excitement that you get around those kinds of creative projects is something that could legitimately transfer, have a permanent place in what the Internet of Things does, supports. The question, um, which I think relates in some ways to what Martha and Mark have asked, um, which is sort of about kind of the process that you envision for the involvement of like nonprofits or civil society groups. So it seems, so one of the key mechanisms, at least if not the key mechanism, right, is giving them access to these data flows, right? So I'm just curious kind of how you see that access translating into social change or protection of interest, right? So like assume, maybe it would help me actually if we like just came up with a concrete example, like, you know, the all of the data from your fridge and home and, you know, pacemaker and whatever, like suddenly, what, who has access to that? Like say it's the NAACP. I mean, I'm, like I'm trying to think of like who it is and then what they do with that data and how that translates into policy change. Like, can you give me some, Kind of, yeah. Uh, so one example might be the coffee maker example. Um, we can stick to defibrillators if you want, but the, the coffee one's more real in the sense it's, it's, it's closer to market. Um, Melita's trying to design these um, coffee pod machines where the pods come with chips. They're chipped so that the machine can decide if you have the right pot, right, if you're using the right pot in the machine. And um, the machines themselves aren't worth very much, um, aren't, aren't very expensive, because the real value chain is in the, the supply of the coffee that follows afterwards. The um, data that the pods generate is supposed to go to the manufacturer uh, because it, it reports on the status of the device and how, you know, how the warming, the elements are working, and whether, the, in fact, the coffee came from the right supplier. Um, the data is also shared with the um, Coffee um, Industry Association, which is probably interested in volumes and perhaps types. And um, like a lot of software applications, the device has a terms of service agreement that is not unlike the DRM we see in, in you know, plenty of other digital artifacts. So for me, the, um, what's the word, um, epistemological problem is that the material world may get filled with DRM, right? With objects that uh, decide whether they're being properly used by the right person and then um, report deviance, sort of in the sociological sense, to the organizations that would want to know whether you're abusing your coffee maker or not. Um, the, the engineers that I've talked to, not really, but specifically about coffee makers, say that the, um, the Internet of Things is, they think of the Internet of Things as a loss leader for the data. So the, 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 the chip prices are falling, the power, there's several power questions that have to be solved, because the chips have to be able to stay on um, for years, right? Um, so there's, there's several power, issues that need to be solved before um, we reach the 200 billion level of, um, but the value proposition is in the data flow, not so much the selling of devices. Does that help or respond? Yeah, well, I think so. I think I'm almost there. So, okay, so say, uh, like, I'm with you on the example. So under your kind of like better IoT paradigm, you know, we would then also that those data flows still exist, right? It's just that we then also give access to those data flows to some fair trade company or something. That's like that's the paradigm. And then what do they do with that? Like, what's what's the next step after? Than I intended. They do their own analysis to figure out where uh, the Haitian free trade coffee growing buyers are, right? And so the the coffee in this particular example, the coffee collective. Um, finds more customers right? and rivals Melita and its own coffee distribution. Let's fair trade um, uh, rival Melita's uh, own coffee supply chain. So I realize that examples maybe look very markety, um, but um, I think the I think it would be very difficult to create um, consumer goods where you could actually purchase this coffee maker and then tell Melita that it gets none of the data. I think, I think it's nigh on impossible to imagine you know, a situation where you buy the coffee maker, you sign up for the terms of service agreement where Melita says, and I'm just picking on Melita, um, 
terms of service agreement says that the data goes to the American Coffee Lobbying Association. I don't think you'd ever be able to prevent that. Um, they would just as soon not sell you the device, right? And we'd have to hope that somebody else would make a, make a similar, similarly good product that didn't come chipped that way. And I don't know if we can have faith that that'll happen either. So if, I'm just, and then I'll stop talking about it. But so if that happens, right, like I'm just trying, I guess where I'm a little bit stuck is how, you know, giving the fair trade organization access to this information so they can potentially market in a different way or something, how that fundamentally addresses the problem that you articulated, which is this idea that everything gets DRM'd, right? Like how is that, how is that like a fix for that problem? Um, I see it as a fix um, in the sense of opening up access. So I don't... Competition. It's so competition, yes. Okay. Um, more than um, closing off the actors that would government and firms that would naturally have access and would want exclusive access to the data. Yeah. Because even if they're able to market better, they still have to pay into whatever scheme to get the correct chip so it works with this coffee maker. That's where like it kind of breaks down for me. Like there's still a level of control that's being asserted by this machine and this chip saying we only work with whatever. So the little Haitian coffee makers might have better marketing, but they still have to buy into it. Right. Yeah, that's true. And um, the other thing we haven't talked about really is the sort of the hope in hacks. So there's, there's enormous potential for hacks and some people call the internet of things the internet of unsecured things, right? It's, um, it, it will be fun, maybe a fun form of civic maker uh, resistance to figure out how to get other pods into the coffee maker you're not supposed to use them in. Um, but, you know, if, we're, if I'm trying to imagine, uh, when I think about um, an infra, when I think about the Internet of Things as infrastructure that might be rolled out in such a way as to rival what China's building internally, so we're talking about um, hundreds of millions of coffee makers, right? Not a, not a, f a few. It's probably market institutions that are going to drip give us the Internet of Things. And so using the markets to create this diversity of opportunity seems like a way to actually shape the outcome. Otherwise, um, the major players design the infrastructure, set the terms of interoperability, and uh, create suites of appliances that only talk to each other and don't share data and don't let you have an influence on who has access to the data. Thank you. Okay, so I guess what the thing isn't about market or not market, it's that your principles fundamentally buy into the idea that the market is around the data and that the data is the thing of value. And that that's what I'm surprised at. So like, let's say that th there was a law that said that the chip's battery could only last one year. We're going to impose a design. So the key manufacturer gets data for one year. And after that, there's a market for chips, like for our cell phones, where then the consumer can go out and buy a chip from the collective. It would achieve, to a degree, the same thing that you're suggesting, but it would happen at the level of design. It wouldn't happen in terms of agreeing that the data just gets generated and leaving that untouchable, but then grappling over how to parse that out or take data away. So I was surprised that you didn't go for a design level question. So then we would have not a market for data, but a market for chips. And then the consumer would choose their relationship to the chip. And the batteries would last one year. So you could force on the consumer a yearly choice. Well, that's kind of annoying, but still. Um, right? And in that case, all you would be doing is regulating battery life. Idea. I have to think about that. If you uh, I think, I think uh, we might agree that there's probably only a few more years to make those kinds of interventions. And that notion, uh, just to pick on the notion of a limited life battery, I would expect that the um, engineering associations and chip manufacturers would go so heavily against that, that it would not doesn't seem like a possible public policy alternative. I mean, I like the, 
I like the notion, it sounds to me a little bit like um, banking cooperatives so, or banking collectives, right? the small organizational forms that the, the banking giants tolerate for a few people who um, actually would want to go shopping for additional chips or do like the idea of um, collectivized banking. But for the most part, um, that's an a small market, there's, lots of, there's more public policy oversight of, of, that, of collective uh, banking co-ops than there is probably of the major banks. Um, I would love to know what a possible path for that, that idea could be. And I can't see the IEEE ever, ever limiting battery life, but I like the idea of the, it's sort of like an, well, I would say aftermarket. Building off that, um, m you know, maybe it's not politically feas feasible to intervene at the level of design. Um, I'm curious about the political fe feasibility of, of uh, your proposal and um, sort of to go one step further. I mean, if you were, w what do you actually think is going to happen? Like what, I mean, how do you see the internet of things sort of unfolding? Do you, do you think there's actually an opportunity for a kind of intervention that, that um, might allow for some kind of, you know, data sharing with groups, with, you know, nonprofit groups, or do you think that, um, uh, you know, we've lost that debate as well. Um, I would like to say we've, can you ask me in five years? I mean, I'd like to say we've got two or three years to maybe change the course, but I would say if we do nothing, um, uh, no, most of the data will end up easily accessible by the NSA and Chinese security services, and most of the data will be easily plumbed by Google, Apple, Amazon, and um, Facebook. I mean, that's, that might be the default easy and sad answer. Um, but I'd also say, you know, uh, yeah, I guess that's, you know, I think, I think, uh, I think the, the other challenge, so I'll give myself another challenge, the other challenge is that most of the public wouldn't be interested in tracking the ultimate beneficiaries of the data that flows out of the thermostat. So um, unless, in, unless traditional DRM can, can be tackled to the courts in some other way that makes makes it clear we can't transport the habits that we have for digital artifacts, the the thing, the um, institutional arrangements we have for digital artifacts to to the material world. Um, I think most people aren't going to demand or expect the ability to tithe, add other beneficiaries, monitor their own health, or even or, or even look at what metadata is being collected and bought and sold. Right? Uh, what's the Pew data? One in ten Americans can't even change the cookies on their browser, right, the cookie settings. So there's a bit of a, there's a public literacy thing too. That's a challenge. Yes. I'm back. I have a, <laughs> I have a slightly different question, um, but uh, I'm, I'm wondering about, so you began this with questions about politics and political power and collective action and things of that nature. And I'm just wondering if, if you've engaged with the question of material consequences of the Internet of Things and the fact that the more and more we rely on the Internet of Things, um, there's an environmental consequence. Yes. And that environmental consequence has, I mean, you know, there are a number of people that postulate that the conflict in Sudan is partly about rare earth materials and you know, that has created a political, cha politically chaotic environment and so on and so forth. So I'm just wondering that are you inadvertently like becoming part of that class of enthusiasts for the Internet of Things without considering these unintended consequences that have potential um, real material impacts on, on, on people's well-being and ability to organize? That's a great question uh, because I uh, don't really tackle the topic of um, uh, technology waste and toxicity and um, uh, the disposal of, uh, of old tech. The um, most of what we uh, most of what we most of what we can write about the Internet of Things is still sort of uh, about imagination because the, th the things that, that you and I might treat uh, as, as 
texts as artifacts in research are the corporate propaganda statements and the cybersecurity PDFs that are made about how insecure the Internet of Things is going to be because of a host of protocol reasons. So the conversation is not um, uh, evolved enough to think about waste and I think the design aspiration is that these batteries will last for decades. Right? And um, you know the internet addressing system has been changed to allow more addresses than there are atoms on the face of the earth. Right? So the, the assum default assumption is growth for the tiny chips and I think you're right we haven't thought through the environmental consequences. Um, yeah, so I guess I'm saying I don't have an answer to that one. But it would make a good book. Just a little side comment of that. Um, Speaking of corporate propaganda statements, I mean, there, I think there will be a big, strong push in terms of wearable tech that can talk to devices so that, like, there will be a shirt that's being marketed that will not go into your washing machine until it's actually dirty and it's going to be being touted as saving the environment so that it's going to be like a marketing ploy that again isn't really going to do anything to help the environment necessarily but uh, I think that there are two sides to that coin and that's that is going to be a marketing tool um, but then the concern that you raise is something that of course we all forget about right as consumers so just as a comment to add Remind people that they're, the data we think of as consumer data, so this notion that your shirt will instruct the washing machine when it's time to, that this consumer data is political, politically valuable to somebody. And so I, I think we have an Internet of Things conversation that's dominated right now by these commercial applications and consumer goods. And um, if we don't move ahead to this next stage of thinking about the environmental impact, of thinking about data mining, um, then it will be too late, right? We'll end up with an internet that, you know, like what we have, something we don't all really like every day. We still use, right? But we look for workarounds and hacks and try to protect ourselves, and most of the population doesn't do that. Um, it's not too late, I think, to remind everyone that this, the Internet of Things is a political tool, too. Okay, this will be our last question. Okay, thank you. I get really provoked when I hear you say that the Internet of Things will close the privacy debate. Um, um, and I don't know where to start. There are two things at least I want to say. One is the time issue. You say that we have a few years and then it's basically over. Um, I was visiting MIT back in 96 as part of a technology policy delegation. And already back then, you know, we saw the intelligent fridge and the intelligent newspaper and discussed how this would all be there in a few years and time for regulation had already passed. And we're now in 2015 and so I think, I think we have more time for this than we think. The, I just think that the development is much, much more slower than what we perceive. So that's one point. And then the other point, I think there are a lot of this thing about the privacy debate being over. I think there are a lot of counter discourses that I think you should maybe include more. And I can play the Europe card as you're also based in Europe, but <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> in a Danish close to EU context, I mean, as you're probably aware, there's such a strong struggle at policy level on basically reforming data protection regulation and really raising the stakes towards what we will, we as Europeans will accept from, from US companies. And I'm not, I'm not saying that it's an easy battle or that the policy solutions are easy, but there is just a strong counter discourse also. And there are a lot of very strong privacy commissioners inspired by Canada, for example, that is really, you know, taking a lead on this. So that's like one response that I think you at least should acknowledge. And another one is at the, at the technical level, that I also see a lot of counter discourses amongst the tech companies that I speak to, uh, touching on one of the previous interventions on, you know, privacy by design, privacy impact assessment, privacy as innovation, privacy as new products that are that are coming out there, and uh, not maybe because of the normative reasons that I would want, but because it's good business, basically, because of a lot of consumers want it. So I think maybe, you know, to nuance your argument, you should take in more of these counter tendencies. Two examples, two um, 
two domains of policy um, from Europe that uh, are interesting for me. Um, the first is that I've become something, sort of a fan of the right to forget initiative in that I think if we could, um, in terms of the list of a better IoT, if we could actually ask our devices to forget or clear the cache or stop counting for a particular period or go dark, that ability might help us feel uh, better about our privacy. Um, I don't know, I'm not saying that the, the right to forget is going to get ported over into the Internet of Things, but I, mean, but I mean that to say that European courts and European policymakers do occasionally do something that throws the rest of the tech industry um, into fits or creative new, you know, or thinking about what they've done. Um, the other interesting thing coming out of Europe is this, um, uh, the impact that Austria is having. So Austria has, um, Austria is unique in that its um, information policy provides its citizens with full control over all of their medical data. And they have the right to demand that any service provider in any other part of uh, Europe uh, remove any records uh, and demonstrate that they've removed records whenever an Austrian goes. And Austria is trying to, Austrian citizen, uh, the Austrian government is trying to reconcile this extreme protectionism with everything else that's going on in Europe. I don't know how it'll play out, except that many people in Europe like the notion, like this particular Austrian kind of protectionism. And so, yeah, we might see that spread too. That, that's an interesting option for us too. Okay, well, it's 1.30, so we've got to close. Talk, but thanks very much, Bill, for coming and talk with us. Thank you.